Hey guys, welcome back. I hope you're having an amazing day. Let's get right into the stories. The first one is an entitled people story. I had always thought that renting out one of the extra rooms in our house was a brilliant idea. It seemed like a win win situation. We could earn some extra cash while helping someone in need of a place to stay. Little did I know that this decision would plunge us into a nightmarish ordeal. After our previous tenants moved out, leaving the house to just my husband and me, we decided to find a new renter. The man we chose seemed perfectly ordinary during the interview, and everything went smoothly for the first few months. He kept to himself, barely crossing paths with us, and mainly used the kitchen and front door. It seemed like a harmonious arrangement until a peculiar stench began to emanate from his room. At first I tried to ignore it, hoping it would dissipate on its own, but as the smell grew worse my concern deepened. My husband, being more direct, confronted our tenant about the issue. The man assured us he would clean up and eradicate the odor, but the stench persisted, lingering like a dark secret. What disturbed us even more was his resistance to allowing us access to the room. He had installed his own locks without seeking permission, locking us out of a part of our own home. As much as I respected his right to privacy, I sensed there was more to this situation than met the eye. Our obligation to maintain a safe living environment compelled us to investigate further. One day, while the tenant was away, my husband made the difficult decision to break down the door. What we discovered inside shattered any remaining illusions of normalcy. The room was a festering den of decay, with remnants of spoiled food strewn across the floor, but the true source of the putrid odor was revealed to be drugs. His room had become a hub for illicit activities. It became apparent that his supposed job was merely a front, concealing a hidden world of drug dealing. We knew we had to act swiftly to protect ourselves from potential harm and legal repercussions. We promptly served him with an eviction notice, expecting a relatively peaceful departure. Yet we were soon to realize that our troubles had only just begun. A few days later, returning from dinner, we discovered our keys futilely resisting the lock. As we stood outside, bewildered, a familiar face emerged from a window. It was the ex-renter himself. He had broken into our house and changed the locks, trapping us outside our own sanctuary. While my husband unleashed his fury, engaging in a heated exchange with the intruder from the front lawn, I dialed the emergency line, urgently seeking police assistance. I relayed the bizarre situation, emphasizing that this was not a mere break-in but an ongoing residency dispute. Law enforcement recognized the gravity of the situation and responded swiftly to our distress call. As the police stormed into our home, we remained at a distance, unable to witness the unfolding events. However, the frenzied shouting and cursing from within indicated that the intruder was not going down without a fight. It was clear he believed he had some rights to the room he had defiled. The officers wasted no time in reading him his rights, placing him under arrest for trespassing and breaking and entering. But the ordeal did not end there. The ex-renter decided to sue us for wrongful eviction, suspending the criminal charges temporarily. Determined to protect our rights and restore justice, we presented the court with the rental contracts and photographic evidence of the room's deplorable state. The evidence was unequivocal, showcasing the necessity of the eviction and justifying our decision to retain his security deposit to cover damages. Justice prevailed, and the court ruled in our favor. He was held accountable for his actions, compelled to reimburse us for changing the locks and repairing the damaged doors. The drug-related charges, however, remained separate from our case, leaving us uncertain of his fate in that regard. With the compensation we received, we restored our home, erasing the scars left behind by this harrowing episode. We made a solemn vow never to rent out a room again, choosing to safeguard our peace of mind and protect our home. My husband suggested obtaining a restraining order, ensuring that the intruder would face severe consequences should he ever attempt to approach or enter our property again. Though we haven't encountered him since, the thought of a possible encounter still fills me with a mixture of dread and anger. One can only hope that fate keeps us far apart, for the consequences of crossing paths once more could be dire indeed. The next one is a pro-revenge story. This story is about five years old, and as you will read in the end, it is still ongoing and will probably continue for a long time. It starts with Mrs. P, the principal, because that's what she is. Mrs. P started as a special needs kids caretaker, studied through the years of work, and graduated with a doctorate in special education. After 20 years of experience, she was asked by the council of a medium-sized city to open and run a new special needs school. She accepted the offer, 
and after four years she had a school with 150 kids, which is a huge number for a special education school. Such schools need more staff than regular schools, not just teachers, but also other caretakers, and the job isn't always clean and easy, so naturally Mrs. P is always looking to hire. Then comes Karen. Karen just finished college and graduated with a degree in education at the top of her class. Her professor was on Mrs. P's school board and recommended her with very warm words. Karen was basically hired before she even sent her resume. Karen is married to Kevin, of course, who finished law school in the top five of his class and is currently doing an internship in a big law firm, waiting to be licensed to practice law. Basically, their future looks bright and clear. All they have to do is not mess up on their path to a nice, wealthy life. Mrs. P. accepted Karen to work in the school and informed her that she would start on August 20th, about a week before the school year starts, as the staff needs time to organize the school for the opening. Karen protested, stating that she was a consultant and not another lowlife who comes to mop the floor. Mrs. P. was annoyed by this attitude, but Karen was top of her class and supposedly the best in the field, so she just smiled and said, The staff starts to work on August 20th, and you are staff too, so be here on that date. Karen wasn't happy, but well, that's life. That pre-opening week the staff will never forget. While teachers, nurses, and other members work together hard to get the school in shape, including painting the walls, setting up equipment, and doing other chores you don't learn in college, Karen fixed up her own room, sat in it all day, and played with her phone. Needless to say, she wasn't very popular among the school staff, but time went on, the school opened on time, and things started to settle into a regular routine. Karen was causing more and more issues. She refused to fill in regular reports about her activities, was unavailable for meetings with staff and parents, and all in all, she acted entitled. Mrs. P. tried to talk to her again and again, but to no avail. Eventually, Mrs. P. asked the professor, the one who gave Karen her degree and was on the school's board, to work with Karen daily and coach her on how to work and function in a real school environment, as apparently she didn't learn that in college. But even that didn't help. Karen was hated by all the school staff, and her work was done poorly and getting worse every week. Mrs. P. had a weekly meeting with Karen and the professor to discuss her performance and how to improve. Meanwhile, important reports and other documents were left unfilled, and the care for the children was getting worse every day. Eventually, a parent filed a complaint about the poor treatment his child received, and the board became aware of the issues. A meeting was scheduled with the board, Mrs. P., and Karen. The professor promised Karen that if she organized her paperwork and acted respectfully, everything would be all right. Karen knew she was in trouble now, but just couldn't stop being difficult. So on the day of the meeting, Karen was a no-show, no call. She didn't show up that day, the day after, or the week after. Without Karen, the board could only hear Mrs. P's side of the story, but they already knew it. So the meeting was delayed until Karen would show up. Needless to say, this didn't help her case at all. Anyway, Mrs. P and the professor tried to reach Karen by phone, but it went straight to voicemail. Eventually, Mrs. P had no choice. Karen had been a no-show and no-call for over a week. She had to have a really good explanation to avoid being fired. Mrs. P called Karen and left a message on her voicemail, expressing her concern and stating that she hadn't heard from her in over a week. She requested Karen to be in contact as soon as possible since finance wanted to cut her pay. Finally, Karen called in. She had been sick the whole time and would return to work in two days. Mrs. P marked the date and scheduled a meeting with the professor and Karen first thing in the morning. If Karen was indeed sick and had a doctor's note, she would not be fired, but she would receive a stern talk about not contacting the school. The day came, and Mrs. P and the professor sat in her office waiting for Karen to arrive. But she didn't come. Mrs. P tried to call her but got her voicemail again. She was angry, and so was the professor, Karen had set a new record in wasting everybody's time. Karen showed up two hours late, and Mrs. P called her to a meeting immediately, before anything else. She asked the professor to join, even though she had canceled her other plans to be there. The meeting finally started three hours late. Thankfully, Karen had a doctor's note, so she was safe on that front. However, she was about to receive a strong reprimand. About ten minutes into the meeting, Karen burst into tears. The meeting was paused to calm things down, but it wasn't over. After a few minutes, everyone reconvened, and Karen spoke up. I am still not okay, I still feel sick, and I want to go home now. Mrs. P. was silent, and the professor commented, As a board member, I must say that as long as you are sick, your job is safe. 
However, since this is your first year, you haven't accrued any sick days or vacation days. You will not be paid for this time. Karen just said, we will see about that, collected her things, and left. Karen remained sick for another two weeks, and her position was left vacant. Mrs. P. did what she could to fill the void, as did others, but it was clear that a person was missing, and the position needed to be filled. Eventually, Mrs. P. called Karen again to ask how she was doing and when she would be back. Karen expressed that she couldn't handle the pressure and wanted to quit. Mrs. P. was stunned by this. Karen was only in her first year, and quitting in the middle of the year could jeopardize her future. Finding another consultant in the middle of the school year was almost impossible. Mrs. P. kept her thoughts to herself and simply stated that she didn't think it was necessary or wise. She told Karen to take some time to feel better and come back. But Karen didn't return, and after two more weeks of absence, her husband called to inquire why no money had been paid. He received the obvious answer that Karen had no right to paid sick leave. He grew angry and threatened to explore legal options, which, in lawyers' terms, meant, I want to sue you. It became clear that the bridge had been burned and Karen would not be coming back. Mrs. P. began looking for a replacement, but the options weren't great. Eventually, she convinced a retired consultant to come out of retirement just to save the year. The replacement started working but couldn't be paid because the position was still officially occupied by Karen, who was still on sick leave. Board members began calling Karen as it was clear that she would not speak to Mrs. P. They asked her to return, and when she refused, they requested her resignation to keep the school running smoothly. Karen claimed she would only return if she was paid for all her sick leave, but nobody was willing to fulfill that demand. The mess grew bigger and bigger, parents started hearing rumors, and the overall climate was not good. Finally, Kevin, Karen's husband, called in and said he wanted to sue the school for payment. He spoke with the city lawyers, who explained that Karen could not sue the school or the city while she was still sick or registered as an employee. She had to stop one of these conditions. The day after, Karen appeared at the school with a standard resignation letter, citing mental and health issues caused by the toxic environment as her reasons. Finally, after more than two months, the position was clear and filled right away. What had been rumors had now become fact, and parents were aware that something had happened. In a group chat with Mrs. P., they asked her what it was all about. Mrs. P. replied that Karen had resigned due to her mental issues. Kevin did try to sue the city, but it went to mediation before a court hearing. The mediator reviewed the material and strongly advised Kevin to withdraw. Kevin listened, and the whole thing was forgotten for a while. Three months passed and the school was doing okay when an email from Karen landed in Mrs. P.'s inbox. In short, dry legal language, Karen informed Mrs. P. that she knew she had been slandering her in public. She claimed to have screenshots as evidence that Mrs. P. had falsely claimed she had mental issues. Karen demanded that Mrs. P. apologize publicly and clarify that Karen did not have any mental issues. Her resignation was due to professional disputes. Mrs. P. was shocked. She knew for a fact that Karen was, let's just say, not mentally stable, and she had a resignation letter to prove it. Karen's approach was beyond stupid. Mrs. P., however, did the right thing and sent the letter to the school board, asking for their opinion on how to proceed. The school board panicked when they heard the words, legal action. They wanted no part in it. They demanded that Mrs. P. apologize and let the matter go. Mrs. P., however, was not willing to admit wrongdoing when she knew she had done everything right. The board claimed she was being stubborn for no reason and stated that they would not cover any legal matters regarding the issue. This went against Mrs. P.'s contract, as her employer should cover any legal liability within her work. Now her job was on the line, and Mrs. P. was determined to fight back and win. But without the city's resources, fighting a slander lawsuit would be expensive. With her job at risk, it wouldn't be easy. Mrs. P. turned to the parents' forum once again, informing them that she had personal legal issues and asking if anyone knew of any help. One of the parents, who happened to be a lawyer, agreed to help without pay. Note, it is highly unprofessional to ask parents for help with personal issues, but it wasn't really a personal issue. It was a school issue. The lawyer's parent noted this after being informed of the details. The lawyer agreed that Karen and Kevin had no grounds to sue but he believed that since they sent the email, their intention was to sue anyway. He advised Mrs. P. to ignore it and let them dig their own grave. And dig they did. A week after the first letter, a new letter arrived in the mail in an envelope printed on Kevin's law firm's letterhead. It stated that the matter should be resolved through a public apology, 
or they would sue. Even the lawyer couldn't believe someone in a large, prestigious law firm could be that dumb. But there it was, the letter to prove it. A trial would take time and cost money, even if he was doing it for free. Not to mention that Mrs. P would be fired regardless of the result. They had to find another solution. The lawyer realized that stupid people needed a stupid solution. He thought about it for a while and remembered that he had a college classmate who worked at that firm. He called his classmate and asked how he was doing now that they were both successful after college. Apparently, his classmate had worked hard and become a junior partner in the firm. When the lawyer mentioned the case, his friend was surprised. He hadn't heard about it, and lawyers in large firms gossip like old women. A slander suit against a special education school? It was the juiciest gossip in town, but it was also a PR nightmare. He and the other partners would never take a case like that, as it would make them look like greedy lawyers who would take advantage of anyone for money. He promised to investigate and find out what was going on in the firm. It didn't take him long. The next day, he called the lawyer back. He discovered that no lawyer in the firm was aware of the case. It turned out that Kevin had used the firm's letterhead to send the letter without any higher-up lawyers knowing. This was good news for their lawyer. Together, they planned the right response to Kevin and Karen, one that would shut them down for good. The lawyer called Mrs. P and shared his plan. It was easy, simple, and malicious. Mrs. P didn't like it, but she agreed because it was the best and fastest way to resolve the situation. Next, the lawyer drafted a settlement agreement and called Kevin to see if it would suffice. The agreement stated that Mrs. P would apologize to Karen in the most public way she can and would post all legally related documents alongside the apology on the school's website. It also stated that the apology could take any form, as long as it could be found through a Google search and had a link from the school's webpage. Furthermore, it declared that after the apology, Karen and Kevin would be barred from suing the school ever again and would have no further demands from Mrs. P or the school. The final clause stated that if any unrelated issues arose from this agreement, Karen and Kevin would be held liable for any consequences, and the school could demand compensation for any losses incurred. Kevin agreed to all the terms, and within two hours, Karen and Kevin signed the agreement. The next stage was ready to launch. The lawyer went to Mrs. P's office with the necessary equipment and the apology transcript. He set up a video camera, and Mrs. P read her apology. She began with an introduction, describing who she was, her career achievements, degrees, and recommendations. She also introduced Karen, detailing her career thus far, and her degree none as far. After the introduction, Mrs. P explained that Karen had claimed to leave the school due to professional disagreements, and any comments suggesting mental or health issues were false. Mrs. P expressed her apologies if Karen or anyone else had heard otherwise or if Karen's feelings were hurt. In essence, anyone who watched the video could understand exactly who Karen was, even without Mrs. P explicitly stating it. After the recording was completed, it was uploaded to the school's YouTube channel, and a dedicated section was created on the school's website, showcasing the video and all related documents, including the threatening letter sent by Kevin on his law firm's letterhead. A link to this section was sent to Kevin with a short message. This settles the matter. Don't contact us ever again. Karen and Kevin had lost the battle. A month passed, and Kevin was suddenly fired from his firm. It turned out that he was not in a position to send a threatening letter using the firm's paper without any oversight from higher-ranking lawyers. His actions constituted fraud. Although he was reported to the bar, a scandal and PR disaster were avoided, and Kevin was simply let go without further punishment. The firm sent a letter to the school, admitting Kevin's fraudulent behavior and requesting the removal of the threatening letter he had sent. The school agreed and graciously removed Kevin's letter, but in its place they published the letter from the firm, admitting Kevin's fraudulent actions. Kevin's reputation in the business was ruined. Any lawyer he approached for a job asked him why he had left the prestigious firm before even advancing past the initial stage. A simple search of his name revealed his fraudulent actions against a special education school. No one was willing to hire him. Meanwhile, Karen continued to search for a job in her field. She had to wait until the new school year began. Her college professor was unwilling to provide any recommendation, and she had to explain the missing year on her resume to potential principals. A few school principals contacted Mrs. P after learning that Karen had worked with her. Mrs. P could only state that, Due to legal issues, she couldn't discuss Karen, 
but that all the information was available in the legal section of the school's website. This was enough to discourage any principal aware of Karen's lawsuit from hiring her. Karen lost that school year and had to find other jobs to support herself. She found a job as a secretary in an office that didn't Google search her name and worked there for a couple of months. However, one day the manager decided to search Karen's name out of boredom. Karen was fired the next day for a minor mistake. More than five years have passed since these events occurred. Kevin is now a lawyer in a sleazy firm that mostly represents low-life criminals. He loses most of his court cases and is known as the low-life lawyer for low-life criminals. Karen is still searching for a job. She can't hold a job for more than six months before being fired for trivial reasons. Both of them know very well why they are doing so poorly in life. Kevin sent another threatening letter, demanding the removal of all mentions of his and Karen's names from the school's website and the deletion of the video. The lawyer simply informed him that this was what he had agreed to. If Kevin wanted to renegotiate, the lawyer would demand compensation for damages. He didn't specify what damages, and Kevin didn't ask. They both admitted defeat. Karen and Kevin lost the war. Mrs. P eventually removed the video from the school's website and set it to private on YouTube. However, all the legal letters are still posted there and will remain until, well, maybe forever. Thank you for watching. I would really appreciate it if you could like the video and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. We'll see you again tomorrow.